and Christoph and, and, and um, uh, tomorrow's speaker, um, we had we had some interesting discussions, let's say, in the speaker <laughs> event on Thursday, and we all agreed that there's a lot of stuff going on with API design that people are just plain getting wrong or not understanding. And Christoph is here to explain how we should really do it or what kind of possibilities we have, aren't you? So you are talking about extensible interaction-oriented APIs. I'm, I'm dying to hear more about that. Take it away, Christoph. You're muted, Christoph. Take, yes. <laughs> oh, that's a typical much thing. Much better, much better. <laughs> so thank you for the introduction. Uh, maybe I will start with a disclaimer. I'm not talking about the way to do things. It's just one tool to maybe add to your toolbox uh, that we've been successfully using also with the uh, my current employer, Authenti. Uh, let me start with a short introduction. I'm a proud lead architect of Authenti. Uh, and one of the things I've been doing, I've been working on an API that was to support uh, interaction-oriented uh, applications, so applications directly uh, interacting with an end user. And of course, we know all those. Yeah? So anyway, uh, Authenti is a, is a startup. It's a startup that uh, provides us with trust services. We are dealing with e-signature, e-identity, and will be uh, soon in e-delivery. So basically registered delivery of electronic communication. Uh, and one of the things that we need to deal with is that we are not solely uh, a platform uh, that provides those capabilities, but we also integrate a lot of providers. And they do the same thing in many, many different ways. And that's one of the reasons we approach the problem uh, the way we did. And I will be talking about it in a moment. But let's start with a bit of a history. Alan, who preceded me in, in the previous talk, uh, actually, I did a bit of my work because he talked a bit uh, about the, the patterns and how things were used in the past. But let me just go over this very, very quickly. So the APIs were basically uh, here originally to, to have the machines talk to each other. And of course, we are thinking, military, we are thinking banking, uh, all those kinds of places where we've been uh, integrating systems together. So integration APIs is an important historical class. And of course, it didn't disappear. It's still there. And actually, I, I think the number of, of APIs is ever growing. However, let me say that we did change the style a bit. So, we originally did something that basically allowed us to telepresence, which basically we operated systems remotely. But then we did all kinds of integration of APIs. And until, I don't know, late 2000s, it was the dominant thing. We did remote procedure calls in all different kinds of technologies, let's say Corba uh, or Sun RPC. We did SOAP RPC style, so classic web services. And of course, then we actually I started to talk about entities, about data, and the document style emerged. And then REST, GraphQL, everything we are now like considering given. We don't even think about uh, an ability to, uh, to, to express the thing we want in, a, in an RPC style. So many people don't really forgot it really exists. But the point that I'm going to make, and uh, please take a note. So one thing I will be returning later is the teletype history. We will be talking about something quite similar in a moment. But for now, we let us make an observation. So Homo tabellarus, so the carrier of a tablet, uh, which is the current user of almost any application, uh, basically uh, needs a slightly different kind of API. And this is the exact kind of API we'll be talking about. Mm, so the API that supports 
the application running on this tablet to present content actually and not much more to interact so okay this is not based on any really uh let's say research but i would like risk stating that currently if we count the number of of actually api calls the balance changed the integration as a reason for for calling an api is a minority is a minority so so effectively the interaction is a dominant reason we call apis from mobile from single uh, page applications and this is the main reason we actually interact with the backend i don't know if it is like twice as many times or five as many times or maybe it's the same order i don't know but the observation is that basically it's growing and there is a limited number of systems we, we do integrate with but the number of applications that we actually build on top of it is ever growing anyway so one thing that i wanted to say that basically we consider that when a single page application calls an api oh it's about the json ajax everything around it well not only actually the classic web serv uh, web is also a huge rest system we all know it yes but this thing that we let us observe that the presentation uh, of a resource as an API actually allows us to think about also the second thing that this JSON describing the content in a slightly different context that they do not really differ that much. And let me go to a short detour. Let's make an analogy. So. Uh, okay, so I was talking about the, the history, the ancient history when we actually World Wide Web was emerging. Well, this was all about APIs, yeah, and it is still. But okay, the, the tour that I promised. So let me ask you a quick um, question, a provocative one. Does your TV enjoy the movies it plays? What does it mean? I mean, okay, let's watch a short video i don't know if you can hear the sound that's a scary movie if you cannot hear the sound there were some terrible sounds there in the background but well your tv didn't really care it was a horror movie if it was a comedy if it was a uh, television theater if it was your breakfast show it didn't care it just delivered, you know, funny blots of color and some eruptions of sound that you, as a uh, person, per uh, perceived as a terrible horror story. And okay, we might be sometimes handicapped. We sometimes cannot perceive the whole spectrum. For example, if I had a hearing impairment that I potentially would need to get some, I don't know, uh, subtitles or uh, even audio description. And exactly this is being delivered to contemporary devices via APIs, the same way as anything around it. I mean, those are very specialized ones, but, but still they exist. But the observation I want to make here is that Whatever the content was produced, I mean, the device didn't really need to understand it. I mean, of course, devices don't understand a thing. We pretend with AIs and everything that they do, but, but we don't care. So, okay, we might deliver a lot of metadata around it. So basically Netflix or any other streaming platform can arrange those things in a com completely un uncomprehensible way so we cannot find anything but they think that they will help us uh proposing some strange recommendations or whatever else uh and for that they need a lot of metadata and this is structured yes it's all about structure and meaning but really the the content itself the thing we are there to watch doesn't change so now let's 
make a note. If you mentally think about your phone, your tablet, even your PC as a sophisticated TV with a touch operable, operated remote, that's the thing uh, that will enable us to make a jump to, in, in the IPI design. Okay, one more analogy. Uh, so, does your API really need to understand? I will show you a show record, a small recording. Okay, it's a chatbot, yeah? There was a time that every conference you went to in banking, all you could learn is about how not to design a chatbot. Yeah, everybody was showing their chatbots and they were completely useless and they still are. Nothing changed really. Uh, but okay, this imaginary scenario is about transferring money to somebody named John. And it's a lot of money, so we are questioning uh, the, the user with like, if they are really sure about it and they uh, confirm it with different codes. Okay, we've all seen it. Now, this chatbot, if there was a new, let's say, step introduced that you need to do before you make a transfer. For example, instead of your uh, code that you get with a text message, it was generated by an application. Does it really care? It doesn't. You don't need another messenger app to talk to a different bank. Whether it's a messenger, it's a Slack, Teams, WhatsApp, a series of SMS messages, doesn't change a thing. So you don't really need a specialized interface to implement the functionality. And this is where we finally approach the conclusion. So, well, uh, one thing before we jump there. So, we need to consider... I tried the, voice recognition technology. I don't know if you can no, hear the voice. I don't do Scottish accents. 11. That is about Please two guys that. trying to convince an elevator to go to the it. right floor because of the voice recognition it. technology and they are speaking Scottish accent. It. Uh, you know, Please repeat that. and it doesn't work. And all I'm talking about today is not about the ability of understanding the responses of a user, because what I'm proposing is to use the ability of the user to understand uh, the content delivered by the system. So it's the other way around. It's not about AI. It's not about uh, the chatbots, which I used as an example. But it's not uh, what I'm really focusing now on. Now, so OK, we know that those things can easily get confused. But we, as people, are intelligent beings. Intelligent beings able to understand and to uh, have the semantic power to process whatever is delivered to us uh, without depending on a structure. We didn't need a hint. It's a horror movie to know it's a horror movie. We don't need a hint. It's a banking application to understand it's about transfer. We don't need another uh, hint well, where do we open the, uh, those text messages? Uh, and, and basically, where do we get the text from? Or maybe we can get it from, from this chatbot. They will tell us, OK, well, I have just sent you the code. But we don't really need it. It's the stupid machine that potentially needs it. And this is where the structure uh, data has its place. And it will ever be there. But now, let me make such a thesis. The total number of interaction-oriented APIs is three, or maybe four. Doesn't matter, maybe five. But what we have just observed, this thing to implement the sophisticated flow of a transfer needed two or three things. It needed an ability to show a message to you. Of course, this message can be a complicated one. It could be a movie. It could be a, some pretty animation. It could be a picture. It doesn't matter. It could be a form. But 
basically a message to you and then get some response. This message is basically only a hint to what is expected from you. Is it maybe a selection of one of many options? Okay, so what do you want to do today? Okay, I want to transfer money. And what are the other options? Well, I want to close the account. It doesn't matter, really matter, but you have a spectrum and the spectrum is limited. You can present it as a series of choices. You can get some input from the customer. Okay, and of course you can make it better or worse Potentially, this code uh, should be only allowing entering digits and not, uh, let's say, letters. But, and for that, you might need some metadata. But actually, effectively, if you just presented with an input field and you got the, the, the whatever was entered by the user to the other end, to the back end, you can proceed to the next step. And okay. You can do as many of such steps as you need. So interactions, when you count the types of interactions needed, they are not that many. This is a limited spectrum um, situation. And what I'm proposing is that if you added a tool into your application, which is an ability to render the spectrum in a generic way, then every time you need the same kind of interaction, you are ready. And now this allows us one important thing, which is a very important aspect of designing APIs that will survive over time. Elimination of a priori and magic knowledge. What do I mean by a priori and magic knowledge? Okay, now I'm switching to my, or oh, actually authentic, uh, let's say business electronic signature okay so if i got a document as a signer and i've got a lot of information actually there are other signers uh, to, actually i know what the signer structure means then of course i have some expectations like okay there is a signature that i need to make and it needs to be qualified and before i do that i will need to uh, make an extra step with a second factor otp yeah this is all a priori knowledge. The fact that I will need an OTP and this needs to be a signature that is qualified and I will need to get some consent in a classic design of an API would be expressed by a lot of documentation, a series of scenarios documented, I don't know, with some postman collection, whatever else, that basically gives the implementer of this application and knowledge what will happen next what do i need to do to proceed this style is there and it ignores the fact that basically uh, this knowledge becomes hard coded when it becomes hard coded a change of the logic let's say the order of steps a very simple change. All those steps is nothing complicated. Uh, needs a change in the app. So the implementer of the API and the implement implementer of the app that uses this API becomes become linked. If I change my API, I will need to announce it in advance so people can adapt. I will need to support two versions for some time. And eventually, somebody will need to make a switch. And of course, we have the versioning strategies, we have the designs that we add fields instead of changing them so that some of them can be ignored, et cetera, et cetera. All about, uh, let's say, support for an API to su uh, survive a little bit longer. But in the end, it's all magic. We just need to know Okay, there will be consents asked for, and we'll need to give those consents to the user to, to, to express their, uh, say, intent. Yes, I want to do that. And if we do it in a particular order, this is exactly what uh, needs to be hard-coded. Our proposal, because of a situation we've been in, so the thing that we had to connect many, many, many providers and new every day potentially, and they differed. We 
we're not really able to release an API that would be stable if we followed this pattern. So what we did instead, well, this is the, where the elimination of this magic comes in. So the minimum amount of information is basically, OK, there is something to act on. Uh, this is a document, let's say, uh, or a process of signing. It has an ID, and that's basically all I need to know. Because from that moment on, I can just express it with generic terms. So I want to act on a document. I don't care if I'm a signer. Okay, I can get it in a, in a, a message to me that I was in a role signer. But if a new role appeared, it would have different options. And I don't really need it because if I ask the way I did here, I can get my list of actions available. Okay, do you want to sign or reject this document? Because that's what a signer can do. Oh, oh yeah, I, I know that I want to sign, so I'm choosing yeah, to sign. And if I'm signing, okay, I will need some consents. Great, this is the list of consents you need to give. And again, in the next interaction, I'm doing the very same thing, repeating the things that I have already collected and adding those new decisions, those new inputs gathered from the user. Everybody, I think, here seen a wizard or step-based interface. And this is exactly what can be very easily implemented with, because not every interface in the world benefits from this design. But it's a weapon if you need this adaptability. And it's also a fallback option for your API that might have a very specific set of endpoints that are there for those who know what they are doing. But for everybody else, they can do the generic thing. OK, so what we've implemented was a challenge action response API system. And the challenge response was there for, for quite a while, honestly, but it was confined usually to security. Let me just, mm, uh, let's say, look at the anatomy of a challenge to understand what the challenge is. So there is a lot of information that is specific to the challenge, but there is one thing that is uh, important, is that all we need really to know how to, uh, to handle a challenge is to know that kind of interaction. So if the challenge calls for entering a value, whether it's a telephone number or it's a one-time password, or it's an email to log in to, or whatever else, really, what we need to know to support it is that we have to ask the, the user to enter something. If it was to select something from a dropdown, OK, we want a list of options. And here is the list of options. That's all we need. If we, there was a, I don't know, uh, a video to be taken of your face to, to do a biometric. OK, this could be another type of interaction. But again, the spectrum is like one, two, five different kind of interactions total. You don't need that many. So you can guess them in advance, and they will survive for a long time. As I've said, in security, challenges were there for like always. So like almost all REST API 403 responses are actually challenges. OK, we sometimes describe them as, OK, there is an error because an access token is invite, which you can so easily translate to say, well, basically, you need to authenticate. So challenges have been there. It's nothing new. It's just they haven't been used to design the API supporting the interaction. OK, almost conclusion a demo time. So we've built a system that basically uses it. OK, this is an application, a mobile application that is used to sign. And it uses a provider. A provider that is very specific, uh, an Italian qualified signature uh, provider called InfoCert. And it has a number of things that are needed. All this application here, except for those data that we see on this very screen, was like unknown at the beginning. We didn't know what are the options to select. Okay, those were the certificates that we 
could use because we knew about it. We could, uh, okay, we've got codes, and this is a one-time password uh, that we've got and we'll use in a second. All those screens were rendered dynamically in an order that was not encoded and the scope of data that we need could be changed at any moment and nothing there really depended on our a priori knowledge of the InfoCert process. Of course, this a priori knowledge is there in the backend, but not in the application itself. So if we want to add a new one, and we have already several, well, we are composing this process from a limited set. This limited set of interactions is all we needed. So, okay, I didn't went into like tiny technical details. I wanted just to uh, you to take a look at this from a different perspective of how creating those, you might say, step-based or interaction-based uh, APIs can enable your, your API and also your applications. And not only your applications, applications of others who connect to your API to get the independence. I can tomorrow release my new API, a new SDK, and the signature process embedded in somebody else's app doesn't really care that much. Okay, they might see a new role, but if they build to this idea, they can always do what they are supposed to do. Maybe it's not the prettiest way of doing it, but... Okay, so we are going over time. So basically, I will sh sh make sure. So it's about evolvability. It's about client lifecycle independence. And it's about support for pluggability of new providers of the same thing. And this was the design uh, drivers that we used. And it helped us a lot. Consider if it is also usable for you. Thank you very much. I think it's time for the thank you traditional slides. So any questions? I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Yes, there are a few questions. Uh, so first question is that, isn't this like hate or uh, like basically hyper media? Um, it is. It API. is. It is. There is nothing new there. The problem is that we have, as, as I actually started my presentation with, it's about the uh, idea of describing of uh, let's say the content without trying to de to describe the structure and the meaning because to those can be derived by the intelligent receiver and the intelligent receiver a person is yeah so we don't need a lot of this bandwidth that is i mean used current like in rest apis for describing things that are completely irrelevant yeah to to let's say the application that does it if we had unlimited bandwidth, we could just basically stream the video that changes dynamically and in, and I mean pass the, the mouse clicks or touches to the other side and we did it, honestly. Mm -hmm. That's what the remote does and the TV does, yeah? So if we had a lot of bandwidth, we could just basically stream the mobile apps. But we don't do, of course, it, because we have limited bandwidth and actually it's not the, probably the easiest way of doing it. But we can basically, by limiting this, this, this spectrum, also save this bandwidth, preserving a lot of benefits. So it's kind of like going the IoT route, but <laughs> with this kind of all that, like having the same limitations as with, with IoT and, and kind of. I mean, even if we didn't have those limitations, yeah, we yeah. probably wouldn't really stream like moving pictures to, yeah. to the generic player, yeah. Although, yeah. let's remember that the browser is the exact thing, it's the generic renderer, it is, it and is, the structure of the events that the people do. And you don't yeah. need a different browser to, to work with a different bank, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that there's also the danger here. Like, I don't know who in the audience, or, or maybe also you have done any kind of like generic uh, state machine type of yeah, <laughs> uh, architecture at one time or another. We've all been there probably, and we've all kind of hit our heads in the walls of that uh, concept. And there is kind of this always this risk of like going too generic. Uh, mm -hmm. 
while still keeping the, the tax. But really interesting concept. And we have here another comment from Michael Hopwood that well, actions remind me a bit of VMF ontology, analyzing everything as a verb, also used behind the scenes uh -huh. like DOI system. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, there are parallels to that. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, as I've said, there is nothing new there. It's as old as, as the computer systems are when they finally were able to talk to people. I mean, when we started with teletypes. So when we interacted via teletype, it was the exact kind of a thing. Yeah. So it rendered you a line. OK, here are your options. Select one or two or three or five or four. Yeah. And we did. OK, option four. OK, next step, next step, next step. Exactly. <laughs> that is oh exactly God. why I started with the teletype history. Yeah. Because that's the same way. The same so thing. back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, but it has been an interesting track. A lot of time traveling in this track <laughs> today. And uh, I think that we'll thank you, Christoph, and thank the audience. And I know my head hurts right now because of all the information overflow that I have received. So get your coffees and, and have some light exercise and come back at 4 uh, p.m. EET and 3 p.m. CET to hear the next talks, which are slightly less technical, more business-oriented in stage one. Okay, thank you, Christoph. See you next time, perhaps.